the services continued in Franklin, and the next great miracle took place the following Sunday. Oh, it was thrilling. I knew something was happening. I knew that I had tapped some great resource. I wasn't quite sure. I wasn't sure. But all oh, the thrill, the joy, the expectancy. I knew the Holy Spirit had something to do with it. I knew, I knew, I knew it. But I knew so little about this wonderful third person of Trinity. I preached again on the mighty power of the third person of Trinity on Sunday, the Sunday afternoon service. Going home from that Sunday afternoon service, George Orr, a Methodist from Grove City, Pennsylvania, was there with his wife, a man who had received compensation for the loss of an eye. All the papers were there to verify it. There was no mistake about it. Going home from that Sunday afternoon service, suddenly, as he and his wife were going over a hill, he explains it by saying that it seemed as though the sun suddenly burst forth in all of its glory. He turned to his wife and he said, Did something just happen to the sunshine? No, she said, I didn't know anything strange. They kept on driving home. When he walked into the kitchen, the first thing that he saw was the clock. And for the first time standing in the kitchen door, he realized he was seeing the time. For both eyes were perfect. He had received sight in the eye for which he was receiving total compensation for the total loss of an eye. I was not there. No one laid hands on him. No one had prayed for him. He had not even asked for himself. But something had happened. Something glorious had happened. And he came back the next night and told it. His face beaming, his face shining. That was the beginning and since that time, literally thousands and thousands had been healed by the power of God. The secret, I searched for the secret. I had nowhere else to go but God's Word. Follow me very closely. Very closely. As I sought, I saw for the very first time that there was more than God the Father giving Jesus Christ. Sure, I had learned it early in that little Methodist Sunday school. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But something else had happened before God gave his son. And I like to think of the three persons of Trinity sitting down at a great conference table planning man's salvation. It would have to take sinless blood, perfect blood. Only the Son of God can measure up to it. And Jesus said, I'll go. I'll take the form of flesh. I'll take the form of man. Absolute deity, absolute divinity, the very son of the living God. 
but to pay the price for man's salvation, it would mean he'd have to come in a form of flesh. But before God gave his Son, before Jesus consented to come, he offered himself first, the Word of God says, through the Holy Spirit. We fail to see this sometimes. I often think of those who try to minimize the power of the Holy Spirit, who refuse to accept the person and the power of the Holy Ghost. Remember, if Jesus could trust him, if Jesus staked everything that he had on the Holy Spirit, surely you and I can afford to trust the Holy Ghost. He knew the Holy Spirit. He knew the mighty third person of the Trinity in a greater degree than any human being has ever known. Even the Apostle Paul, with all the spiritual insight, with all the glory, with all the secrets that God trusted him with, Yet the Apostle Paul, he thinks, never knew the power and the person of the Spirit as Jesus the Son knew him. He was the resurrection power. Jesus knew it. He was the power of the Trinity. Jesus knew it. Jesus had faith. Jesus had confidence in him. And so he turned the first of all, me thinks, and said to the Holy Spirit, If you'll be with me, if you'll come too, I'll go. I'll go. And me thinks the Holy Spirit not this head. And then it was that God gave his only begotten son that you and I might have life eternal. And Jesus came in the form of flesh. He came as a babe in a manger. Literally God in the flesh. Grew to manhood. Yet methinks the three were not united until that hour when Jesus came up out of the waters of baptism. Oh, glorious moment. Oh, thrilling moment as Jesus came up out of those waters of baptism. And in that moment something happened. A voice spoke. It was the voice of God when he said... This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. No man, no woman, can ever stand before the great Creator, can ever stand before the judgment seat of God and say, I didn't know who Jesus was. For God himself left no doubt in the mind of any human being as to who that babe was in the flesh, as to who that one was that came up out of the waters of baptism. Who that one was who was nailed to that center cross. No man can plead ignorance as to who Jesus Christ really is. For God himself spoke. And to all generations to come said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. 
in that moment something happened. Oh, glorious moment. It must have been one of the greatest thrills that Jesus received as he walked in the flesh upon this earth. For the Holy Spirit came upon him in the form of... He thinks he was saying, I'm here now. I'm here now. Things will happen. We're running on schedule. <laughs> I kept my part of the agreement. Man will have salvation for the whole body. I am here. Oh, it must have been such a reassuring time for Jesus. I wish I had been there. And then it was that miracles began happening. I know I too speak of the miracles that Jesus did. I know. We read the miracles in the ministry of Jesus. We always think of Jesus performing those miracles. But I want you to remember something. That when Jesus walked this old earth, he was as much man as though he were not God. Of course, in the same sense. He was as much God as though he were not man. But he had to take the form of flesh. He was tempted. Because he was in the form of flesh. He could have yielded to those temptations. If Jesus could not have yielded to temptation when he was here on earth, if when Jesus stood face to face with Satan, and was tempted by Satan, remember that was not the first time that Jesus, the Son of God, and Satan had met. Always remember that. Satan knew Jesus very well. Jesus knew Satan before he became Satan. Jesus knew him when he was one of three of the most powerful angels that God had created. He knew him before the fall. He knew him before he said, I will be like unto the Most High, and began to ascend into heaven, having become jealous of God. And God in wrath, not being able to allow sin in heaven, thrust him to the earth. And he became a disembodied spirit. We know him today as Satan. You know, my friend, that was not the very first time that they came face to face with each other. When he stood before Jesus and literally offered him the title deed to this planet, to this earth, if he would bow down and serve him. And remember something, this very hour, Satan still holds the title deed to this earth. He once ruled over this planet, over thousands and thousands, methinks there could have been millions of angels. This was his great empire. When God created Lucifer, he gave him the title deed to this earth. He still holds it. Jesus knew that he held the title deed, that he was not lying. When he offered the title deed to this planet, to this earth, if Jesus would bow down and serve him. Jesus could have turned to him and said, you're a liar. But Jesus knew he was not a liar. He knew he held it. One of these days, my friend, when Jesus comes back to earth, King of kings and Lord of lords, is going to change the whole thing. 
There's coming a day, and that's one reason why Satan is working overtime. He knows that his days are numbered. He knows his hours are numbered. His time is short as a great world ruler. Know that. One day he's going to have to forfeit the title deed to this planet, to this earth. For there's coming a day when the surface of this earth will be renovated by fire. And the city of the new Jerusalem, John saw it in the spirit, comes down. And this old planet becomes our eternal home forever and forever and forever. And in that day, Jesus himself will hold the title deed to this planet. And we will be a part of that great inheritance and shall rule and reign with him. Oh, sure. Those miracles in the life of Jesus were performed by the Holy Spirit. Know that. Jesus knew it. Jesus knew it was the power of the Holy Ghost that performed those miracles. He was just as dependent on the Holy Spirit as you and I are dependent on the Holy Spirit today for every miracle that we take place. That's the reason, beloved, before Jesus went back to glory again, he left to the church the greatest gift that he could leave the church, this glorious body of Christ, his bride. We belong to him. We're the gift that God the Father gave to his Son. We, the church, the living, vital body of Christ, the bride, we were born into this wonderful body of believers. We are the gift that the Father gave to his Son. That's the reason Jesus, looking up and talking to the Father, said, These that thou hast given unto me. And love is something that you do. And just before Jesus went away, he wanted to give to his own, to give to his church, a gift. And the greatest gift that he could give to his own was the one who had been so faithful and so true to him, who had never left him had never disappointed him. And the last words that he said before he went away, he said as he gave the gift, and ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. Oh, I wish I could stand on the highest mountain top. I wish I could shout it until every man, every woman who stands behind the pulpit, every priest, every rabbi, every minister could know, could hear, could understand, believe it, receive him. This wonderful gift that Jesus gave to his church, this body of believers, it was a sacred gift. It was a holy gift. There was no greater gift that he could give. And he wanted to give. God the Father had just given him the gift, the body of believers. Jesus, in turn, wanted to give this wonderful body of believers the gift that had been given to him, a gift. And let me ask you, what greater gift could he have given? And he thought of those miracles that the Holy Spirit had performed through his ministry. He thought of the great manifestation of the power of the third person. He knew 
What a great comforter the Holy Spirit had been to him. And the word comforter means strengthener. He knew the Holy Spirit had come and had been his strengthener during those days of loneliness. During the time when he was spat upon. During the time of ridicule. During those days when it seemed the whole world did not understand him. All men had forsaken him. And for a time it seemed that even his disciples had forsaken him. And yet the Holy Spirit was there. Strengthening him. Do you know the glorious strengthening power of the Holy Spirit? Paul did. That's the reason Paul said at the close of one of his letters. Perhaps it was a moment just at this moment that I'm talking to you as we think about our spiritual experiences the closeness the deepness the glory of those experiences and Paul said the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ He's so merciful. And the love of God. And who can fathom God's love? And where would any of us be without the mercy of the Lord? Without the love of God? But he didn't stop there. Paul continued, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Fellowship, that closeness, that oneness in the midnight hour when it's so dark. Jesus had that fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Jesus never went down in the hour of temptation because of the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus had the courage. Jesus had what it took when the hour came, when he had to yield his own will to the will of God the Father and two wills became as one. You and I cannot do it except for the power of the Holy Ghost. Do you know him in that sense? Jesus knew him. Jesus understood. Jesus knew the secret of his earthly victory. And that was the reason he turned and in his last bequest said, And ye shall receive power. The same power that had been manifested in his ministry, in his life, his daily life. Don't you see it? Can't you see it? Oh, if only I had the ability. It was the greatest day of my life. It changed not only my life, it changed my ministry. This ministry is what it is today because of the power of the Holy Ghost. The power of the Holy Spirit. How better can I tell you? Are you a minister standing behind your pulpit? You are seeing no result. You're a discouraged man, but you really won't admit it. You dread going into your pulpit, really. You dread facing your congregation Sunday after Sunday. You won't even admit it to your wife. Sometimes you wish you were out digging ditches. You wish you could just be an ordinary somebody instead 
a man of the cloth is discouraging. Not seeing results. You're not satisfied. May I just say to you, won't you turn it all over to the Holy Spirit? Won't you turn your ministry over to the Holy Spirit? Won't you turn yourself over to the Holy Spirit? Won't you turn your will over to the Holy Spirit? You have a new ministry. You'll be a new man. You have a new congregation. There'll be a vision there. You'll get results. <laughs> And ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. What happened on the day of Pentecost? He came. Jesus said he would come. And we know that Jesus made heaven safely. I'm so glad to know that. We know that he did. We know that he arrived on schedule because the Holy Spirit it arrived on schedule because Jesus said is expedient for you that I go away because I have to go back to take the position of great high priest at the right hand of God the Father and after I will have arrived I will send the Holy Spirit and we know that Jesus made it and that he's in position of great high priest because the Holy Spirit came it all worked out on schedule just as he said it would the hundred and twenty filled with the Holy Ghost. We call it the day of Pentecost. Things happened. Oh, I'll tell you, they had exciting times in the early church. Things were happening. Remember something, we talk about the day of Pentecost. We are still living in the day of Pentecost. Today is still the day of Pentecost. And we have every right to have the same things happen in our churches. This hour has happened on the day of Pentecost. Because it's the power of the person of the Holy Spirit. And the day of Pentecost will not come to an end until the Holy Holy Spirit leads, and when the Holy Spirit goes, he takes the church with him. We call it the rapture of the church, and then will be the end of the time of the Gentiles. I know the secret to the power in this ministry. I know the secret in those who are healed by the power of God. The secret is found in the person of the Holy Spirit. I have chosen to accept the gift that Jesus left for me. 